You know, something that we do to get them to buy into that is we have something called a kickoff meeting. And this relates to football, but it could relate to the first day of class that you do. And here's something that we do at the kickoff meeting. We do an activity called rowing the boat. And I've done it for 30 years. It's very popular right now to coach at the University of Minnesota. Uh, coach Fleck, who does a great job, and I'm sure he learned it from somebody as I learned it from somebody. As simple as that. But with a rowing boat the activity goes like this. How about if you pretend like you are a member of my team? And I'm going to ask you to participate in this activity. So the first thing that we're going to do, and please do it as, as you're sitting at home there, as I tell this story. I tell everybody, start rowing the boat. Like they did on those old boats where the guy beats the drum and they got to row the boat and the guy walks down and screams and yells at them. Everybody's rowing the boat, all right? That's our team. We're all rowing the boat. Now I go on the board. And what I write on the board is this. Let's take the example of my last team at Ponitz. I wrote on the board, Ponitz Panthers, 2018 Ohio Division III State Champions. Ponitz Panthers, 2018 Ohio Division III State Champions. That is our goals. Now, I want you to pretend and visualize you're in the audience that I'm giving this talk to. I want you to visualize you giving this talk to your students. As simple as that. All right, and what I say is, all right, my brothers, now every one of you start rowing. Because in order for us to achieve that goal... We all have to row. We all have to do our part. What's that mean? That means this summer that you've got to come to workouts. That means this summer that you have to behave in, the, in, the, in your neighborhood. That means when you come back to school in the fall that you've got to be a good student, be a good, uh, participate in the class, be respectful to your teachers, be respectful to your, to your, your, your classmates. You've got to come to practice and work hard. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to understand everything on the character card. All of that is rowing the boat. This is what we're doing when we say row the boat. Now, the next thing that I asked them to do is I said, imagine that half the people on this side are rowing and half the people on the boat are rowing on this side because that's the way the boats are. There's a dividing line in between. Now, everybody keep rowing and look at your goal. You've got to focus on the goal, my brothers. Ponus Panthers, 2018 Ohio Division Three state champions. Start rowing, my brothers. Now what I do is this. Two of you stop rowing. All right, just sit there and do nothing. For all of you that, that have any kind of math knowledge at all, our boat is going to veer off. And the harder all the rest of us row, the more we miss our target. Here's our target. We're going this way. We're not going to make it because those two are not rowing the boat. They haven't bought in. They don't believe. And then I tell those two, you start rowing again. Well, you've got to, and everybody's got to keep rowing the boat. As simple as that. We have to have a passion. We have to have a goal. We have to know where we're going. The card, and here's where I tie it in. This card has to become your card. If it's my card, then you're not on the boat. You're not rowing. I'm rowing the boat. It's got to become your card, and you row the boat. Now we got a chance of succeeding. Every one of you is important. If a couple people aren't rowing the boat, the rest of you have to inspire them to row the boat. Because we've got a goal that we want to achieve. We've got to focus on that. Now, I do it with tremendous passion. i got to be honest with you. I will say this. Ponies Panthers, 2018 Ohio Division Three state champion. Row that boat. Row that boat. you got to be fired up. I make no excuse for not for having passion. Because if I don't have it, it's not contagious with my team. If I don't have it, everything will remain my card, my plan. They won't see the belief. They won't buy in. You've got to create a plan, but you've got to get it to become their plan. Now, the other thing that I do is I have a parent meeting. At the parent meeting, I will bring the character card out, and I will explain to the parents very clearly, this is why your son, and there were a few cases, daughter, is in the program. You have to understand it. I then do the rowing exercise with the parents. They love it. I said, you've got to buy in. When they come home, here's the message I'm delivering. I want you to understand it's on the card. I give them a card. I hope that you can reinforce the card when they come in. Never make an excuse for passion. It's got to be good passion within the rules. You know, talking about uh, character time and how something that happens in your daily life 
It's something you can use in character time. One of my favorite stories of something that happened, and then we put it there in character time that afternoon. And it's just my favorite story also, one of my favorite stories, because it reflects on how wonderful people can be. It happened when I was at Withrow High School in Cincinnati. Withrow is on Madison Avenue, and right up the road from Withrow is a place called Buskin's Bakery. They have the best donuts that you've ever had in your life. And a couple times a week, I would stop and get a donut on my way in in the morning to Withrow High School. Well, one morning I was standing in line, ready to get my donut, and a fireman was in front of me. He's put in a fairly big order, and there was a fireman, and then me, and then an older gentleman, older than me even. The fireman goes to pay his bill, and the older gentleman says, I'd like to pay that bill. And he said to the fireman, I just want you to know how much not only I, but this entire community appreciate what you and all the policemen of the city of Cincinnati do for our community. And this is one of the very small things that I can do. And he paid for it. I ordered my donut and I turned around and while they're getting my donut, I said to the older gentleman, I said, thank you. you. You taught me a lesson. I should have done that. I appreciate the firemen and policemen. I just didn't think of it. And luckily, there's been a few times since that where I've been able to do that. And I'm very proud of it. And I think that we all should do that if, if, if it's a part of what you believe in. All right. So I walk out, I get in my car and I get in my car. It must be a Cadillac. Now, just a side note. You know, I didn't take very many days when I was sick days when I was teaching over the, the, the 40 some years that I was a full time paid employee. And I got a check for $19,000 for my sick days because there were so few I took. I took that check and I bought myself a Cadillac. I grew up in Maslin, Ohio, and the dream of every young man in Maslin, Ohio was to drive a Cadillac. I could never afford it on a teacher's salary. But when my children were all gone, I got my sick day. I went to Voss Cadillac. I said, give me the best Cadillac you can give me for this amount of money. And that's what I was driving. So anyway, the gentleman comes up, knocks on the window. He says, uh, I see you driving a Cadillac. I said, yes, sir. And I told him that story. I'm very proud of my Cadillac. He goes, well, he says, I know who you are. I recognize you. You're the coach up there at Withrow. And he said, he said, you're coaching for free, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, I really appreciate what you're doing. He said, and I appreciate what you're doing for the community. I said, well, thank you. He says, as a matter of fact, he says, I own a Cadillac dealership. I actually own 19 car dealerships. He said, the next time that you go buy a Cadillac, why don't you come by? And he said, I'm going to fix you up with a pretty good deal on a Cadillac. I said, that's wonderful, sir. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Mr. Ronald Joseph. I said, oh, my gosh. Joseph, all the, everyone's heard of it, major sponsor all over the community, and Dayton and Cincinnati. I said, Mr. Joseph, it's just my pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. Drove off, finished eating my donut, sitting in my office at Withrow. It's late in the afternoon. I get a phone call from the main office. A gentleman just stopped by, an older gentleman, and he dropped something off for you. Well, I went up to the main office, and it was an envelope for me. And with the envelope was this letter. And I'm going to read you. As you can see on the top, it says Ronald Joseph. And I'm going to read this letter to you. It says, Mr. Place, thank you for your nice comment at Buskin Bakery. I believe that the Cincinnati Fire Department and Cincinnati Police Department, privately and publicly, need the support of our whole community. Congratulations on the sports and football programs at Withrow, and I wish you continued success. Sincerely, Ronald Joseph. Now, here's the key thing. Attached, uh, included in that letter was a check made out to Withrow High School football for $1,000. Now, for our basic budget, they, they gave us our helmets and shoulder pads, but our budget for everything else was $4,000. I just had a 20% increase in our budget because of a gentleman that I met in the donut store. You talk about a special human being. Well, how does that tie into the character lessons? That afternoon at Waits, I showed them the letter. I showed them the check. That's just a copy of the check, quite obviously. And I said, what's the lesson here, guys? And I got different answers. Be nice to people in donut stores, and this, that, and everything. But finally, one of the players hit on it. And then I elaborated on it. They got the basic message. And here's the basic message that I gave those young men at Withrow High School. If you're willing to do the right things, there are people out there in the community that want to help you. If you really and truly say, I will do the right things, there are people that are just waiting for you to do that, and they're willing to help you. And Mr. Joseph is an example of that. You know, we talked about Mr. Joseph numerous times ever since that time in programs that I've run and the kind and spirit that he has and his willingness to help young people. Now, something else had happened. I sent Mr. Joseph a thank you note. 
And I told him, Mr. Joseph, we're going to use this money to pay for pregame meals. We don't want our players going home. And who knows what they're going to eat. Sometimes they can't have the transportation to get back to school for the game. So we're going to keep them at school and give them a pregame meal. But we got to pay for that. Your check just paid for five pregame meals. As simple as that. Uh, or it was a fourth pregame meal. I take that back. So it was wonderful. So I got the following check. Another week later, I got this uh, mail in the mail this time. This says, here it is again, Ronald Joseph on the top. Dear Jim, I very much appreciate the sincere note you wrote. Your efforts to manage and keep healthy your team are most admirable. Sincerely, Ron, Mr. Joseph. And again, a check for $1,000. Now all of a sudden our budget's gone up 50%. You know, a funny side note to that is my principal said, keep writing this gentleman thank you notes. You know, uh, I kept a relationship with Mr. Joseph. I went on opponent's high school. He continued to donate. Matter of fact, he increased his donations a little bit because he believed in helping young people so much. I can't tell you how many times I've used the example of Mr. Joseph when talking about character time with my team. Disclaimer number three. Everything here is based on my experiences. There's almost nothing that is research-based. You know, I think a lot of times you go to a college class and a vast majority of the material is research-based. That's not the case in this class, number one. That's not my area. Everything in this class is going to be based upon my experience in my 40-plus years as an educator. You know, I have a philosophy. I think in order for any program to be successful, you have to have a balance between planning and implementing. To me, the planning is extremely important. If you got a program that they didn't plan, it's not going to work. What, what, what good is it? You know, I like to tell the story of the Japanese gardener. A very wealthy man here in the United States of America hired a Japanese gardener, and for a whole month, he sat there and did nothing but just look. And the man was getting worried, because every day the gardener would just sit in the garden, and he'd just look. He went out in a very short time, four or five days, put together one of the most beautiful gardens you've ever seen in your life. It was the talk of the town. It was so good. And they, they said, what happened? Well, by the time the 30 days were up, he knew everything about the weather, the wind, and every possible element. He observed it for 30 days. His plan was that good that the result was a wonderful garden. Well, I believe in the balance between planning and implementing, but I think in the field of education, planning is a very small part, and maybe 10, 15%. It has to happen. Implementing where it's really happening. You've got to go out and implement it. Sometimes you get great administrators that are a little heavy on planning and they're not great on implementing, and they're not overly successful. Sometimes you have administrators that aren't great on uh, planning. All they want to do is implement. They don't have a plan. They're not successful. You've got to have a plan, or excuse me, a balance between planning and implementing. Well, this particular class is very, very heavy on implementing because that's what I did. I'm going to talk to you about what I did for the past 40-some years and how I applied it to develop a good attitude in students. Now, what my goal is, is to challenge you to make your plan. You know your situation. You know what will work for you. And as simple as that. Okay? All right. Disclaimer number four. Nothing here is original. In other words, everything that I'm going to present to you today, I have borrowed, stolen, heard from someone else. I don't want to present anything as being my material. But you know what? Why not steal? I think education is based upon borrowing learning from each other. You know, I, I love the days when I would, would go to clinics and learn from other coaches, not so much in the formal talks, but just go out in the halls and talk to guys or go to lunch with a guy. Or, or now I go to character clinics. And I can't tell you how many times at a discussion table I picked up this or I picked up that that I, that I learned from a participant in the clinic. You know, um, one thing is also, though, is that because the whole class here is based upon implementing, one thing about implementers, and you're, I'm an implementer, you're all implementers, we make mistakes. Here's our plan. Here's our philosophy. We don't always follow it. We don't always stick to it. So I would hate for you to say, boy, Jim Place talked about this, and then I heard one time that, that he got angry, and he, sure I did. We all do. You know, we make mistakes, but there's one thing about having a plan. I look back on my mistakes, and I say, you know what? That wasn't who I am. That's not the way I want to do things. That's not my philosophy. When I get away from my philosophy and my plan, that's when mistakes happen. That's when bad things happen. You know, once you make that plan, and you're an implementer, 
go ahead and, and do it just as simple as that. And you know, talking about things being original, look everywhere. You don't know when something's going to fall in your lap that you're going to say, you know what, I like that. I'm going to use that. You got an opportunity to talk to other educators, be a sponge, absorb, talk to them. You know, I want to talk about the actual character card. For years, we had 10 keys to good attitude and 10 keys why you're in the program. And those are the two components, the most important components on the character card, which I will explain later. Well, I went to a clinic at the University of Michigan and was sitting next to a friend of mine, Danny Starkey. And the speaker was a coach from California who had won 104 games in a row, won all kinds of national titles. And he got up and he started speaking. He was going to speak for three hours. And he was like a California surf, surfer dude. He looked up at the air and talked about how nice a day it was. And he's talking for an hour and we're like, this guy's, this guy's the most successful coach in the country? you got to be kidding me. Then all of a sudden he said, let me tell you about how we're, the key to our success. He talked about his character card. The card itself is very different than my character card. But bang, a bulb went off. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take my system, combine it with his system, and come up with my new character card system, which I've used for over 20 years now. What's my point? My point is borrow from other people. Always have your ears open. It doesn't have to be original. All right, disclaimer number five is my job's easy during this class. I'm going to tell you how I do things. Now, I do apologize for something. I'm going to constantly make football references. Well, that was the primary area of my career. In other words, I'm so proud and I put tremendous passion. I hope I did in, the, in my full-time position. But the football career drove me. When I took a new job, I took it to get a promotion in the area of football. And I also use football as a conduit to help young people. And I also use football as an example for what I hope you will do to apply to my other t jobs, which was primarily teacher. As simple as that. You know, when I first started doing these workshops, I said, you know what, I'm going to talk about, well, this is how you do it in the grade school, and this is how you do it in middle school, and this is how you do it in high school. And you know what I found out? I don't know anything about grade schools. Grade school teachers look at me and they went, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me give you an example of that. Remember when I told you about running the youth camps? The first year we had youth camps, we wrote the schedule out, a really nice schedule for today. We put it one hour for lunch. This is 150 young men, grades four through eight. After about eight minutes, we had 52 minutes of havoc. I mean, what do they do? We cut it down to 20 minutes, and that was too much time. You know, one of the rules then that we made was they were getting up, running around, and, and hitting each other, and fighting with each other, and doing this, that, and everything. We said, you have to sit in your chairs. Well, that was great, except they started sliding their chairs next to each other and hitting each other and fighting each other. I said, oh my God, I don't know any about grade schools. For me to go and tell a grade school teacher, do it this way is crazy. So what I thought to myself is this, talk about what you know best. What do I know best? I know using football as a way to help young men become better human beings. So a lot of the references that I'm going to use during this entire class are about football. It's not that I say football is that important. It really isn't. Football is just a conduit. But it's what I know. Your challenge in this class is hard. Can you take what I present and, present and put it into your classroom situation? As simple as that. You know, disclaimer number six is this. I go to a lot of clinics. I used to be strictly football clinics. Love them. Now I go to football and character clinics. As a matter of fact, I go to more character clinics now than I do football clinics. And when I go to a clinic, I have two goals. Goal number one, can I take one thing that the speaker presented and put it into my everyday life. If I can, that was a great clinic. Absolute uh, a great use of my time. If there's one thing I said, okay, I'm going to start doing this in my program, as simple as that. The second thing is, all right, there's nothing that I heard from the speaker that I want to implement. Good talk, enjoyed it, no one knew anything. But you know what I did? I reflected on how I do things. And I said, you know what? I like this. I don't want to change. I think we constantly have to keep reflecting on how we do things. You know, go back to the character card. The character card, I, I, I take pride, is what I'm known for. I hope when people think of Jim Place, I think they don't think of the character card. What do they think of when they think of your classroom? What's the basic culture that you're trying to establish in your classroom? 
You know, and go back to that uh, consistency. Some people have said, Coach, do you look at it every year and do you change it every year? And there's a lot, a lot of positive points to that. And I say, no, you know, I've thought about that, but I like the consistency. I like for young men to know what I stand for. I like for my past players to come back and talk to my young players and say, is this what the old man still teaches you? It works. This is, this is, this is what, what works is that. I've had a lot of assistant coaches come to me with all kinds of plans and say, hey, how about if we do these T-shirts? Good idea. How about if we bring the kids in in the morning for a boot camp and they crawl through mud? And, Decent idea. I'm not sure about to climb into the mud, but you know, bring them in early for boot camp things. Here's a big one. Let's have goal boards. 15 offensive goals, 15 defensive goals. I really find trouble believing that that is uh, going to motivate a young man to perform on Friday night or practice harder to achieve those. But I, I, I buy into it. A lot of coaches, that's what they believe in, as simple as that. But you know what I tell all of those assistant coaches? Guys, those are great ideas. And when you have your own program, I hope you implement them. But we're going to do one thing. We are going to do the character card. That's what we stand for. We're going to put all our passion into it. We're going to make sure everybody understands it. Uh, as simple as that. Okay, next area. I hope you're following along in my logic. Let's start out with what we've covered just so far. You can improve the academic performance of your students if they have a good attitude. That makes sense. If they have a good attitude, if they're motivated, they're going to perform better in classroom. Attitude is the key to that. Character education is not on the plate. It is the plate. It's something we have to incorporate into our daily routine, and we'll see the progress that we want to in the academic performance of our students. Win little battles. We don't have to do it all at once. The only mistake you can make is do nothing. We have con tremendous control over the attitude of our students. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is not to realize that we have this control. I hope you're following me with the logic of all of that. Well, then we come to this question then. Then why aren't we spending more time on it? Why aren't school systems spending more time on it? I'm going to spend a significant part of this class talking about that because it was swimming upstream. Coach Jim Place believes this. I don't think that American school systems are set up the way they should be to promote character education. I think that when you say, I'm all in, I'm going to make this happen, you are fighting a battle. You, your administrators, your building principal, even maybe your superintendent, your school board, you're going against what the traditional American values say, this is what the schools are for. You know, you've got that dreaded T word right now dominating education, testing. You know, think of this. When you went for your last evaluation, how much time of your evaluation was spent talking about what you're doing to improve the test scores of your students as opposed to what are you doing to make your students better human beings? You know what? You got to realize what the principal's being evaluated on. He's being evaluated upon how are the test scores of your building? What's the superintendent being hired and fired upon? What are the test scores of your building? As simple as that. So to blame it on someone, to blame it on the system, it's just the way it works. We are cogs in the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to write down on your worksheet right now, what keeps you from spending more time on character education? Okay, welcome back. Now, what I want to do is I want to tell you 10 things that are on my list. And then what I'm going to do in the end is I'm going to summarize why what you just put on your worksheet is important and why what I'm going to tell you or present my ideas is important. I'll do that at the end after I go through all 10. All right, for reason number one, very obvious reason. How many of you put this down on your sheet? I have to spend my time on the academic content. That makes a lot of sense. You are hired to teach students history. Are they going to be better at history at the end of the year? You hopefully they hope so, or else you'll be fired. Teach them math, teach them science, teach them business, whatever it is that you're hired to teach. Teach them third grade material, teach them sixth grade material. Those are the academic contents that you are hired to teach. If you can't do that, no matter how committed to education, you're not doing a good job. 
But again, the two go together. Character education is not on the plate. It is the plate. It can be combined. But don't forget, you're uh, hired to teach academic content. Just as simple as that. Number two, I alluded to this earlier. How's everyone evaluated? Everything in the school is evaluated based upon those state standards. Well, you know what? None of those state standards are set up to reflect character education. Now, we're trying to change that. I'm very proud that one of our local educators, I'm sorry, not an educator, one of our local legislators is Mrs. Peggy Lehner. Peggy Lehner is the head of the Joint Committee on Education in the Ohio legislature. She is a very powerful woman. Nothing happens in this state in education that doesn't go across Peggy Lehner's desk. She is totally committed to character education. She is challenged by ways to incorporate it. One of the biggest challenges is how do we evaluate it? How do you measure it? But I can tell you this, she has a tremendous passion for trying to put that in. But how do you put that into evaluation? So reason number two is it's very, very hard to evaluate. Reason number three, clerical duties. What all do you do every day? You got to take attendance. You got this form. You got that form. You got to return parents' calls. You, you, this and that other thing. You, you got to open the blinds. You got to make sure that everything. This student doesn't have a pencil. You are swamped with clerical duties. Reason number four, it's just not part of your routine. It's not built into that. I referred to that earlier. You get put on automatic pilot. You come to school. You, 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 you punch the clock. You sign in. You go teach your classes. You go home. Where in there is time to reflect upon character education? It's one of the reasons that it's, that it's not part of what we do. Thank you.